Alrighty, so now that we've kind of done the type of energy analysis we did with Newman projections for, you know, straight line structures, and hopefully you guys crushed that worksheet, we can kind of do a similar type of energy analysis with cyclical structures, namely cyclohexane. But we kind of have to do it in a slightly different way. We're not exactly using Newman projections. But before we kind of get into that type of energy analysis with cyclohexane, I first want to talk about why we're going to only do it with cyclohexane. Okay, so do you guys remember in the last video I talked about steric strain as well as torsional strain. And I don't need to remind you, I know, because you guys got this down, but remember steric strain is that physical bumping into each other of groups, whereas torsional strain is that electron repulsion in the bonds that groups make with other atoms, but the, the electron repulsion is between two sets of groups, between bonds. Okay. Well, there's a third type of strain. It's called ring strain. Okay? And ring strain is this type of strain where you have a cyclical structure and the actual geometry of the ring prevents the bonds in the ring from obtaining the angles they want. So, let's just say, you know in methane, the bonds are 109.5 degrees. Well, let's just say, I'll give you an example. In cyclopropane, right, a three-membered ring, right, we're looking at a triangle that's going to be equilateral, we have 60-degree bond angles. We don't need to be math majors to see that 60 degrees is much less than 109.5 degrees, right? So there's some strain associated with that. That's clearly going to cause an energy hike in that molecule. Cyclopropane is a very highly strained molecule and is very high energy, pretty unstable, doesn't really exist often. Okay, so let me just kind of go through why cyclohexane is the bee's knees. Okay, so in cyclopropane, we have these 60 degree bond angles. Not good. Let's add one more carbon, cyclobutane. A little bit better, right? We know those are 90 degree bond angles. Better, but still not great. All right, now let's, so strained, less strained, but still highly strained. Now let's look at cyclopentane. Now cyclopentane is common. It's, you see it all the time. There's some ring strain associated with it because I don't know the exact bond angles, but I know it's a little less than 109.5, but we can live with that. Cyclopentane is just a little more higher energy than some other molecules. However, when we get all the way over to cyclohexane, we've hit the jackpot. And this is why you see it in nature a lot. Because of the geometry of the ring and the way it can arrange itself, we hit that magic number of 109.5 degrees, and we have zero ring strain, baby. So that's why nature loves six-membered rings, because it can adopt these 109.5 degree bond angles, and that's why we're going to choose to evaluate its energy confirmations when we add groups onto it. So let's get to it. So now that we understand why cyclohexane is so important and so prevalent in nature due to its zero ring strain, let's get to seeing how we can draw it and evaluate its energy conformations when we put different groups on it, much like we did with Newman projections. Okay, so first, like we did with Newman projections, I need to kind of show you guys how we draw cyclohexane. This is the bond line way we draw it, right? But if you kind of humor me a bit, this is just in the plane of the board, right? This is completely flat. You know, there's two hydrogens at every position, but in reality, this is not how cyclohexane is arranged. We need to kind of draw it in a different way that gives us more insight as to how it's spatially aligned. And to do that, we draw what's, uh, maybe you guys have heard this in class already, but it's called the chair conformation. All right, I'm going to draw it. I'm going to kind of explain to you why it's called the chair conformation, and then we'll go through the way to draw it. Because at first, it's like you don't even know how to make lines anymore. It's kind of weird how to draw. Okay, so here's how you draw the chair conformation. Okay, so looks super funky, right? Looks nothing like the bond line version we've drawn over here. But rest assured, this is cyclohexane, just drawn a little bit differently. All right, so. First and foremost, there are one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, all right? So no worries, still six carbons. So to kind of introduce you to what this is, 
we can fill in our groups on this cyclohexane like we do like we can on this chair. So it's some terminology. You can see how if I start here, I can go down to this carbon, then I can go up to this carbon slightly, then I can go down to this carbon, then I can go up to this carbon, down to this carbon, and up. The carbons in the chair conformation, they alternate from going down, up, down, up. To kind of put a name to that, these up groups, if you want to call them up groups, up carbons rather, you can call them peaks. That makes sense, right? Because you have to go up to a peak to get to it. You have to go up. On the other hand, the carbons you have to go down to, those are called valleys. And there's a reason why I'm kind of giving those names. If you're to look at a peak, you have two types of, so we know that there's two hydrogens or just two things bonded to every carbon, right? So at a peak, the way you draw that is you can go straight up and, whoops, not exactly straight up. You go straight up and then slightly down. And we don't have anything on these except hydrogen, so I'll fill those in. On a valley, however, it's a little different. We can't draw straight, well, we don't draw straight up. What you do is you go straight down and instead you go slightly up. So it's a little different. So if I'm going to go to this peak, I go straight up and then slightly down. Also, it doesn't matter if I draw this to the left, I could have also drawn it to the right. It doesn't matter. So I went from valley, peak, or sorry, peak, valley, peak, down to a valley. And at a valley, we know we go straight down, slightly up. And at this carbon up here, so this is a valley, so since they alternate, I must be going to a peak. I go straight up and then slightly down. And then from a peak to a valley, I go straight down, slightly up. That one's a little weird to draw. Okay, so at every peak, you have straight up, slightly down, and at every valley, you have straight down, uh, slightly up. The names for these, if you're going, so if you're straight up or down, right? You're not, you're not off to the side, you're straight up or down. Those are called axial positions. So you can be axial up slash axial down. On the other hand, if you're slightly down or slightly up, that means you are what's called equatorial. So again, you can be equatorial up or equatorial down. So if we're going to kind of go through the ring again with these new terms, I have an axial up and I have an equatorial down at a peak. And then at a valley, I have axial down, equatorial up. So here we have axial up, equatorial down, go to the valley, ax or axial down, equatorial up. So you just need to know these terminology, these two terms, because those are, no one really uses up, down, like uh, straight up, slightly down. They would say axial up, equatorial down. Okay, so now that we've kind of nailed that down, let me show you guys my easy starter process to drawing a chair because eventually you'll kind of get your own method but here's how I think it's the easiest. What I do is I draw an upside down propane little three carbon chain right then I kind of go from that bottom position I go slightly down and then I go I draw a regular propane to the right and then all you have to do is connect this these two positions together connect these two positions together and you've drawn yourself a chair. On the other hand, so not only can you draw a chair this way, but if I were to draw my upside down propane again, instead of drawing my propane to the right, you can draw it to the left because you can also draw a chair like that. And we'll get to more of that uh, in a few minutes, right? Just know that unless you're super comfortable drawing chairs right off the bat, kind of just doing it like I did over there, just use the technique of draw an upside down propane, go below it, draw another propane to the right or left, and connect your dots. Okay, I'm going to erase some of this. I'm going to give you an example of how if we put a couple, a group or more than one group on this ring, what do we do? How do we evaluate energy confirmations? And believe it or not, it's super simple. In the cyclohexane worksheet I have for you guys, 
right after you watch this video, there's plenty of chair drawing practice, plenty of uh, practice using the terms axial and equatorial. So don't worry, I know you're gonna nail this down as long as you watch this video and do the worksheet. Okay, so I wanna do like two or three more things, so just stick with me. So in bond line, I'm gonna draw this type of, I'm gonna draw this ring for you, and now stick with me, I'm gonna introduce a new thing to you guys. At any position, I'm gonna draw two, the two hydrogens involved on this carbon right here. So in organic chemistry, there's a way we signify if a group is above the ring or below the ring, kind of like an up or down designation. So if you want to say that something is above the ring, what you do is instead of drawing just a generic line, you actually draw a wedge. So you draw like a little triangle type thingy and then you kind of darken it in. That's a wedge. This means that not only do we have this ring in the plane of the board, but coming out of the board, if I drop this eraser, the marker would show where the hydrogen's coming. It's coming out of the board physically at you. On the other hand, if you wanted to say something is behind or underneath the ring, below the ring, or it would be back in the back of the board, it would be actually be behind the board, we actually do that using a dash, like that. So wedges mean above the ring, dashes mean below the ring, or through the plane of the board. Okay, so knowing that, I'm gonna draw something for you guys. And then we're going to kind of draw on a chair, a cyclohexane chair. Okay, so on this carbon right here, I'm going to draw a wedged methyl group. So if you ever see this, that means methyl group, or if you see someone explicitly right in CH3, the methyl group would be above the plane of the page, the board, whatever you're working on. And some people don't even have to fill in the dashed hydrogen. It might be implied, but I will for you guys. So we have a dashed hydrogen as well. So if someone asks you, hey, go ahead and draw this in the chair form, here's how you would go about it. So I'm gonna draw just one form of the chair. Here's my upside down propane. I'm gonna go below this, I'm gonna draw my propane to the right. Connect my dots, there we are. Here's the beautiful part. You can pick any carbon to be this dot, uh, darkened carbon that I uh, have designated. So I like to pick the top left, don't know why just who I am. Okay, so stick with me on this. You see how the wedge, we, set, we established that the wedge carbon is above the ring, right? That means he is up. So with this carbon, we need to draw the methyl group up. And we know it peaks up as axial, right? So he goes straight up, CH3, and that means the hydrogen is down. And right here, down is slightly down or equatorial down, right? Not hard. Now here's the part where it might get a little tricky. Rings are in this constant state of flipping between this one, this state, and the other state that I showed you, how you can draw the propane to the right or to the left. So now we need to do a little bit of a ring flip. So let me draw that for you guys. Okay. So some things change when you do a little bit of a ring flip. So this carbon is actually this carbon, right? Every peak, when you do a ring flip, every peak becomes a valley, and every valley becomes a peak, okay? Just, just know that. So, if, I'm, if, if I've now identified where my dot carbon ends up, your groups stay up or down. That doesn't necessarily mean they stay axial or equatorial. So, I know my methyl group is up, because it's on the ring like that, right? So, no longer is the up axial, He's going to be up equatorial, right? CH3. And that now means my hydrogen is still down, but he's actually axial down, okay? As long as you can follow this, you are a ring drawing, ring flipping ninja, expert, professor person, okay? So, let's do one more, then I'll kind of introduce the energy aspect to this. So let's erase this. Where is that? Okay. Let's say I gave you guys a ring like this. And on this carbon, I draw you a dashed isopropyl group. Whenever you see the connection between a dash or a wedge and extra lines, all that matters is that this is an isopropyl group below the ring, which means we must have a wedged hydrogen here as well, right? Cool. So let's draw one version of a ring. 
draw my propane to the right, good stuff. Okay, like I told you, you have the luxury of picking whatever carbon you want to draw this isopropyl group on because it's the only group on the ring, right? So I'm just going to pick this ring, or this carbon right here. Okay, so remember, our hydrogen is up, we're at a peak, so we're the hydrogen is up axial. The isopropyl group is down equatorial. Okay, easy money. Let's flip the ring. So remember, when we flip the ring, we still draw our upside down propane, but instead, you just draw your propane the other way. But remember, this dot carbon goes from a peak to a valley, so he is right there. Okay, so our hydrogen is still up, but he's up, he's up axial here, that means he's up equatorial here. And the isopropyl group is down equatorial here, he's still down, but now down is axial. Okay, not bad. So let's add one more element to this, and then the video is done, and you guys can unleash your wrath on this worksheet and draw as many rings as your heart desires. Okay, so let's just say I have a methyl group up here. Let me take the train wheels off a little bit. I'm not going to draw the hydrogen and I'm not going to draw the CH3. On the other hand, let's say I draw down here, I draw a T-butyl group, right? Because that's one carbon, that's tertiary, if you block this out, three carbons. Okay, let's draw one version of the chair. Okay? So here's where it matters. I'm going to pick the methyl group to be here, which up here is up axial. So now there's a one, two, three, four relationship between these two. So I have to count, since I've picked this to be my carbon, I have to count four away. That's where the T-butyl group goes. One, two, three, four. Okay. And he's down. This is a valley. So he's down axial. Awesome. That's one chair for him. But now let's flip the chair. Remember, it has to look the other way. Okay. So now stay organized. Make sure you have the carbons here where they appear over here. So this dot carbon is right here. And I'll count four away from it. That's where this asterisk carbon will be. One, two, three, four. That's where he ends up. Okay, now let's draw the groups. Methyl group is up. He might not be axial anymore, right? Because now he's up equatorial because we went from a peak to a valley. There's methyl group. However, T-butyl group is still down, right? And at this, we're going from a valley to a peak. So instead of being down axial, we are now down equatorial. Okay, and this is the last point I want to make. So, when groups are axial on a, a chair, there's a maximal steric, steric torsional strain, whatever you want to call it. Because if you can see, there's a down hydrogen here. These two guys are, you know, there's maximal steric strain, uh, torsional strain, and the symbol for steric strain is actually this. You draw two lines that are kind of like interwoven with each other. Again, there's another group over here. If I'm looking like this, right, these guys are in line with each other. However, when, you're, when you put your groups ax or equatorial, you avoid all this nasty strain you get when groups are axial. So, take home point is, if someone ever asks you for the lowest conformation of a chair, throw the biggest, bulkiest groups uh, equatorial. If you have to put some groups axial, make sure they're the smallest one, but make sure your biggest, bulkiest groups, like here, the T-butyl group, would take priority. You would want to make sure he's equatorial. It worked out that both these guys were ax or both equatorial, but that helps minimize strain. Okay, get at that worksheet. We have one or two more videos left, and we're almost done with alkanes.